spectacle without precedent in the world, the United States hails her greatest fleet on Navy Day. At the Brooklyn Navy Yard, the carrier name for President Roosevelt is commissioned by President Truman to start the festivities in New York. Celebrities gather aboard the 45,000-ton battle giant, and the skipper gives the orders. Place the ship in commission. The commissioning pennant flutters aloft, and a new recruit joins the Navy. One of the greatest crowds in New York's history lines the streets to cheer the president on his swift tour of the city before he reviews the fleet anchored in the Hudson River. Amid a swirling storm of paper, the president drives up Lower Broadway, receiving the acclaim of countless thousands. The president stops at City Hall, the first to visit here while in office, and stands on the very spot where George Washington read the Declaration of Independence to his troops. History is in the making today as Mr. Truman arrives at Central Park to address more than a million persons, again one of the largest crowds to assemble in New York. The president makes a clear statement on the foreign policy of the United States as he says, The foreign policy of the United States is based firmly on fundamental principles of righteousness and justice. In carrying out those principles, we shall firmly adhere to what we believe to be right, and we shall not give our approval to any compromise with evil. The world cannot afford any letdown in the united determination of the Allies in this war to accomplish a lasting peace. The world cannot afford to let the cooperative spirit of the Allies in this war disintegrate. The world simply cannot allow this to happen. In the Hudson River, a victorious Armada awaits President Truman as he is piped over the side of the mighty battleship Missouri accompanied by Admiral Ingram. It was on the deck of this 45,000 tons of fighting steel that the Jap surrender was signed. And it is an historic moment in the Navy Day pageant as the president inspects the plaque commemorating the occasion. The commander-in-chief signs the ship's register. Forty-seven fighting ships stretch seven miles up the river, while millions throng New York's Riverside Drive to witness the city's first presidential review since Dewey's triumphal return from Manila. The destroyer Renshaw ties up to the Missouri to take the president aboard for his ten-mile inspection tour. During the period of the review, more than 1,000 Navy planes roar overhead. Accompanied by Mrs. Truman, he starts the historic journey. In the skies, he sees the power that helps spell doom for Japan and victory for America. As he passes the cruiser Macon, the first 21-gun salute is fired. During the review, 1,000 guns roared their tribute. The New York, veteran of two wars, is next. Big Mo, christened by Margaret Truman, salutes. The Enterprise, the carrier that would not die, and all the gallant naval craft that brought victory were bought and sustained by your bond purchases. Now, more than ever, they have earned your support.
Never did our flag wave more proudly than in this pageant of sea power, a power which President Truman has told the world will be dedicated to the cause of peace. As the sun sets on a spectacle unforgettable in American naval annals, the president nears the end of the review, and a new chapter in our history has... He is received at the White House by President Truman for a ceremony that comes as a complete surprise to him. In the presence of a large crowd, the president bestows the Congressional Medal of Honor upon the man who courageously fought a hopeless fight that America might arm. Let us use that force and all our resources and all our skills in the great cause for a just and lasting peace. I have just returned from Berlin, the city from which the Germans intended to rule the world. It is a ghost city. The buildings are in ruins. Its economy and its people are in ruins. War indeed has come home to Germany and to the German people. It has come home in all the frightfulness with which the German leaders started and waged it. The German people are beginning to atone for the crimes of the gangsters whom they placed in power and whom they wholeheartedly approved and obediently obeyed. How glad I am to be home again and how grateful to Almighty God that this land of ours has been spared. We must do all we can to spare her from the ravages of any future breach of the peace. That is why, though the United States wants no territory or profit or selfish advantage out of this war, we're going to maintain the military bases necessary for the complete protection of our interests and of world peace. Bases which our military experts deem to be essential for our future protection and which are not now in our, uh, in our possession will be acquired. We will acquire them by arrangements consistent with the United Nations Charter. The German people are beginning to atone for the crimes of the gangsters whom they placed in power and whom they wholeheartedly approved and obediently followed. How glad I am to be home again and how grateful to Almighty God that this land of ours has been spared. We must do all we can to spare her from the ravages of any future breach of the peace. That is why Though the United States wants no territory or profit or selfish advantage out of this war, we are going to maintain the military bases necessary for the complete protection of our interests and of world peace. Bases which our military experts deem to be essential for our protection and which are not now in our possession, we will acquire. We will acquire them by arrangements consistent with the United Nations Charter. The Conference of Berlin laid down the specific economic and political principles under which Germany will be governed by the occupying powers. They seek to rid Germany of the forces which have made her so long feared and hated, and which have now brought her to complete disaster. They are intended to eliminate Nazism, armaments, war industries, the German general staff, and all its military tradition. They seek to rebuild democracy by control of German education, by reorganizing local government and the judiciary, by encouraging free speech, free press, freedom of religion, and the right of labor to organize. German industry is to be decentralized in order to do away with the concentration of economic power in cartels and monopolies. Chief emphasis is to be on agriculture and peaceful industries. 
German economic power to make war is to be eliminated. We're going to do what we can to make Germany over into a decent nation so that it may eventually work its way from the economic chaos it has brought upon itself back into a place in the civilized world. The results of the Berlin Conference have been published. There were no secret agreements or commitments apart from current military arrangements. The military arrangements made at Berlin were of course secret. One of those secrets was revealed when the Soviet Union declared war on Japan. The Soviet Union, before she had been informed of our new weapon, agreed to enter the war in the Pacific. We gladly welcome into this struggle against the last of the Axis aggressors, our gallant and victorious ally against the Nazis. The Japs will soon learn some of the other military secrets agreed upon at Berlin. They will learn them firsthand and they will not like them. The British, Chinese, and United States governments have given the Japanese people adequate warning of what is in store for them. We have laid down the general terms on which they can surrender. Our warning went unheeded. Our terms were rejected. Since then, the Japanese have seen what our atomic bomb can do. They can foresee what it will do in the future. The world will note that the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, a military base. That was because we wished in this first attack to avoid, in so far as possible, the killing of civilians. But that attack is only a warning of things to come. If Japan does not surrender, bombs will have to be dropped on war industries, and unfortunately, thousands of civilian lives will be lost. I urge Japanese civilians to leave industrial cities immediately and save themselves from destruction. I realized the tragic significance of the atomic bomb. Having found the atomic bomb, we have used it. We have used it against those who attack us without warning at Pearl Harbor, against those who have starved and beaten and executed American prisoners of war, against those who have abandoned all pretense of obeying international laws of warfare. We have used it in order to shorten the agony of war, in order to save the lives of thousands and thousands of young Americans. We shall continue to use it until we completely destroy Japan's power to make war. Only a Japanese surrender will stop us. The atomic bomb is too dangerous to be loose in a lawless world. That is why Great Britain, Canada, and the United States who have the secret of its production, do not intend to reveal the secret until means have been found to control the bomb so as to protect ourselves and the rest of the world from the danger of total destruction. I shall ask Congress to cooperate to the end that its production and use be controlled and that its power be made an overwhelming influence toward world peace. We must constitute ourselves trustees of this new force to prevent its misuse and to turn it into the channels of service to mankind. It is an awful responsibility which has come to us. We thank God that it has come to us instead of to our enemies, and we pray that he may guide us to use it in his ways and for his purposes. The victory in Europe was more than a victory of arms. 
It was a victory of an ideal founded on the rights of the common man, on the dignity of the human being, and on the conception of the state as the servant and not the master of its people. We have learned in this war that a society of self-governing men is more powerful, more enduring, more creative than any other kind of society, however disciplined, however centralized. It was a victory of one way of life over another. A free people showed that it was able to defeat professional soldiers whose only moral arms were obedience and the worship of force. We know now that the basic proposition of the worth and dignity of man is not a sentimental aspiration or a vain hope or a piece of rhetoric. It is the strongest, the most creative force now present in this world. 